We welcome you back. I can't wait to talk to our next guest. Uh, I have known him a long time from his days as the head football coach at Sanford University in Birmingham, where uh, he uh, took a transfer with him from Salem and made him one of the great young quarterbacks in that division. He turned out to be Jimbo Fisher, who is now, of course, one of the best coaches in the country. Terry Bowden won his first 20 games at Auburn University. Uh, he had a perfect season his first year, winning National Coach of the Year Award. And uh, he was introduced earlier this week at Monroe, uh, where he has already hired a pretty impressive staff, include, including Rich Rodriguez. Uh, Coach, it has uh, been way too long. Uh, great to have you. Uh, how are you doing? Paul, I'm doing fine. And I've, I've watched and admired the job you have done from those days. You just caused havoc over down there in Birmingham <laughs> with all of us. Uh, you, you, you seem to be doing a pretty good job of doing that all over the country. I enjoy watching it. That, you know, I was I was sitting there thinking about you today, and I, I had uh, I don't know why I'd forgotten uh, some of the coaches that you uh, helped get started. But uh, I would imagine uh, watching Jimbo Fisher go from uh, and you once said he was one of the better quarterbacks you had ever had. Is that right? I think he was the best. I mean, if you're talking about who is the best college quarterback, uh, how many? You're, you're five nine. Well, Jimbo probably says he's five nine. He's five what <laughs> five eight maybe. I, you know, I all know I'm five six. He's taller than me. No, Jimbo was the best quarterback I've ever had. I've had, I mean, from pure coaching, quarterbacking, leading a team, being a quarterback, and I've had some really good ones. Stan White, Damian Craig, they were they were outstanding too. They may not have been tall enough to be NFL first round picks, but when it comes to being a college quarterback, that's not the same thing as being the best NFL uh, prospect. But Jimbo was a leader. He was a fighter. Uh, the player, the linebackers, and the offensive linemen like to hang around with him. That's the kind of guy he is. Well, I am uh, really happy. I was talking to Tim Brando the other day. He called me and uh, he yeah. said, I'm on the way to introduce Terry Bowden. And I said, well, this, this well, first of all, we'll, we'll, I mean, two guys who like to talk. Uh, did you ever get a chance to talk at your own press conference? <laughs> Timmy's one of my best buddies. And, 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 and my father, he first inter my, interviewed my father in 79 when we went undefeated that year at Florida State. Tommy and I were grad assistants and Jeff was a walk on. We were all down in Tallahassee. And Tim was a was a Cub reporter, I think, for someone. And he's been close to me. You know, he imitates my dad probably uh, he, he better than anybody. And so they've always been close. He really enjoyed it. My father came out at 91 to be to the press conference. I've known him for a long time. I, I did radio three years in a row, three hours a day with Timmy B. <laughs> Timmy's my best buddy. But he could take us into a segment, out of a segment without stopping. So I've been with him many times. How is your dad doing? You know, Dad's doing great, uh, uh, Paul, and that's the, that. We're very fortunate. Uh, in September, uh, when I was in Atlanta getting ready for the Georgia Tech game, I got a call from my brother Jeff. The dad had just got out of the hospital with the COVID, and, and he has, of course, pre-existing illnesses uh, from from type two diabetes to a, a little a blood leukemia type that he's always had. And he was wasn't doing well, but he wanted to go home. He had been there over for over two weeks, and so he came home. Jeff did not think he looked well. He couldn't eat. He couldn't respond. We got, I got into a town car and had somebody drive me. I had to drive me all the way to Tallahassee. All my family showed up. He, he wasn't doing well, and he was lost so much weight he wasn't eating. Uh, and, uh, you know, they put, you, you go into an ICU unit, and you, your wife's not allowed to be there, and your kids aren't allowed to be there. Uh, you realize that what, but what must go through your mind when you're 91 years old uh, and you never see anybody. So he, he came home, but he wasn't doing well. But, you know, he started eating a little bit. When he came home, he said, I got to eat my He asked for a peanut butter banana sandwich, so I knew he was getting healthy. And so he finally got his weight back, his strength back, and today he looks just like he did before he got sick. Him and my mother doing fine. They flew over here and sat in our press conference uh, Monday uh, at 91 and 88, and they're doing fine. And, uh, they, you know, they, they, this, this, hey, this is the only game in town. There's only one bout still going. It's the <laughs> ULM. There have been a few. Well, Coach, I am, I, I'm, it's such an obvious question. You're still a young man, but uh, yeah. explain uh, why, why, why this job, why now? <laughs> you know, I, I love being here. For somehow along the line, whether it was at Salem or Sanford or even the way Auburn, Auburn had played coming into my time or Akron, I've become kind of a turnaround coach. I have a coach that I've tried I've, over the years. I've wanted to move up. I've taken over programs that weren't very good, and I've wanted to move up. And I probably wanted to fo follow football like my father too much, and then I wanted to take over small college programs and work my way up to the big time. And once I got there, I put pecan trees in my backyard, and I chose to stay there like forever. 
and probably turned down a few that might have gotten. Uh, and that's what I always have done. Now, what's different was I took that 10-year hiatus to uh, ABC television. I got to go from Auburn to the studios in Times Square with John Saunders, and you know how difficult it is to get in this business. That wasn't a bad little deal. You know, that gig was pretty good, and I almost never left it. Uh, but but at this point in my life, I'm 64 years old, uh, and I, I left Akron with a new boss and uh, that wanted to go a different direction. But like a lot of coaches, I had a, I had a guarantee for a couple of years, had some cash. I said, I'm, I'm going to go to a major, major program, and I'm going to study coaching again. I'm going to study these guys. My intent was to, to maybe get another mid-major, a job that needed a coach to turn them around. And so I went there with that intention. And there's only 127, about 10 of them opened up this year, and a 64-year-old man got one of them. I mean, does, does that make sense to me? When you were uh, at, at Clemson, what, what was that like, learning and sitting back as a, yeah. almost a student again, even though uh, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> Dabo Sweeney, uh, I think, was barely uh, walking, was barely in high school. By the, by the, he, he was at Alabama by the time you got to, now, got to now, uh, Auburn. Paul, now, now when I got here, and I'm, I'm sitting in the very back of the room, and again, I, I wasn't acting like a student. I had to go to grad school to become an analyst. They had no positions. I had to be a student. So I shocked Dabo, and I said, Coach, I'll go to school. So after 34 years from graduating law school at Florida State, I, I got my master's at Clemson. And right now at ULM, I'm still taking my final six hours online <laughs> to have a Clemson. That's the truth. So I think I'm finished up with a degree. But that's the only way I could get there as to be an analyst because they had filled up their positions, and I couldn't be a free because you can't work their computers or get their keys without being somehow tied. But that being said – Paul, you were there probably my first uh, time I ever coached against Alabama on the Plains, and we had that 11-0 season. I'm coaching and calling plays on the sidelines, and there on the field is Lebanski Hall and Mickey Kahn. And on the on the sideline was uh, Danny Pierman coaching tight ends, Woody McCorvey coaching wide receivers, and a young graduate assistant named Dabo Sweeney. And all those people were going against me. And you know when you call plays and you run an offense and you, and you win the Iron Bowl against Alabama – you get some street cred, and I think I always had a little bit of street cred with those guys, and I think when I got to Clemson, the biggest thing that I had was respect. Five years I coached the Iron Bowl, but three times we won it. Coach Stallings and I coached the final four years in Birmingham when it really was the Iron Bowl. I had I, I don't have any losing records against any team in the, in the SEC West, and that's a pretty good league. Uh, and so there's some street credibility there, but I went there to learn. I wanted to see what this dad, what Dabo – uh, Coach Sweeney, I have a hard time calling him Dabo. Coach Sweeney um, uh, was doing over there, and, and and the more I was there, I, I saw how many things he could do at one time. How sharp he really is. He's kind of like that Opie look, a Southerner, but he's a, he's, a, he's he controls everything. Is and, and and I don't know. If, and they do everything that whatever Alabama does, they know because that's where they came from, and they understood what Alabama has done in their commitment, and they've made the commitment to do as much or more in everything they can do. Uh, and by doing that, he took him after Tommy left and he took over from Tommy's staff. He's, he's created an entire different environment there, a culture there. The facilities are second to none. The culture, the winning record is second to none. And I hired a bunch of young guys because I wanted guys. I think people have done this in Alabama over the years. They, they get people there because they're winners. They know how to win. They know about winning. And Bear Bryant, what he said, I ain't nothing but a winner. And I think with Dabo Sweeney and all those young guys I brought over, I wanted a bunch of guys that weren't nothing but winners. And, I, and that's important because it, it, when, you, when you have a culture of losing or you don't know how to win, uh, it's hard to get that off of your mind. Talking to Coach Terry Bad, and, and Coach, I'm just wondering, as you reflect back, and I know you're trying to look forward, mm -hmm. but here you are, you're – you're the son of one of the, the iconic coaches in college football history. You established your own uh, identity. And, and there was a time in right. 1993, 94, you were literally considered the best coach in the SEC, the hottest coach in the country. You, you accomplished a great right. deal. It, you know, I mean, I was about to say it ended badly at Auburn, but that would be every coach ends badly at Auburn. Um, but right. yeah. and, then you had the, <laughs> and then you had the run. I mean, you've, you've had an amazing career. I know I'm, not, I'm asking you to analyze your own, uh, your own, your own right. odyssey, but it's pretty amazing. Well, you know, I mean, first of all, I, I, it, the Auburn didn't have a bad ending. It had an unusual ending. And it, I mean, we, it would be considered a bad ending because it didn't end good, you know. And, uh, but I got, I got from Auburn, I got hired by ABC back when the, you know, that was the year Disney bought ABC and right. ESPN. And it was still BCS big time games on ABC and everything else on ESPN. And I was a studio host in the 
biggest uh, studio show in the, in the country at, at ABC in New York. I mean, Herbie, Herbie and, of course, and those guys had everything before noon. We got everything after noon. And so it was quite a move up. And as and, and, uh, and far as doing something in football, being a spokesman for football, but was that difficult at Auburn? Yeah, it was. There were a lot of things that, you know, I, I, I had great times there in reflection. I can look back and see what a wonderful time it was, but there were some difficult times there. Any time that you come in a situation, and you're young, and I probably didn't handle them all perfectly. That you got to be pretty much of a veteran. You don't sit around the Bobby Bowden table and learn how to handle everything at Auburn. Now, I promise you. Uh, but and you know, I got and life kind of threw me some wild, some some curveballs, but I probably swung at some wild pitches too when you think about it. Uh, but it was a great time. I look back on that with fond memories. It, it, and you know what? In looking back, I, I, I'm now coaching my 26th year as a head coach, and most people that leave Auburn don't ever coach again. Not, so how many times have they got a few years in? But I feel blessed that I'm still coaching, and I'm still relevant to the hundred or so guys here. I'm not relevant as far as the, the, the all the top who are the top guys, who are the top salaries. I've never, I was never ever going to be close to being the best coach in my own family. So somewhere along the line, that teaches humility. It teaches you that, that you have a role to play, and, you're, and your old man won't retire till he's 80. He don't leave a lot of records for you to go after. <laughs> and so there were, never was any. There was none that I had left, uh, and yet we thought that with Bear Bryant, nobody could take his record away of six national championships, but that's happened. Uh, but anyway, I'm blessed. I'm still got, I've got the same number of players that kneel in front of me that, that Nick Saban does uh, and that uh, Dabo Swinney does. And you know what's what's funny? I, my Tommy and I grew up in Morgantown, uh, and that's where we grew up and coached football and learned how to coach. Twenty minutes away, Rick Rodriguez grew up. Uh, Thirty minutes away, Jimbo Fisher grew up, and twenty minutes away, Nick Saban grew up. It's an incredible place of grinders, blue collar background, coal miner fathers. Uh, there's something about them there hills that make you tough uh, and make you overcome and make you handle tough situations that. Boy, it gets it gets you. You may not always have the right answers, but tough, hard work will get you through. Do you find the right answers? Nick Saban is six years older than you, and he's asked every press conference at the at the end of the season, "How much longer are you going to coach?" Uh, <laughs> is, is that even something at this point now that you're starting that, that you really even think yeah. about? Because you you don't you seem like you've yeah. you're in be, you're in better shape than I've seen you in a long time. Yeah, you you know how heavy I got at times, but I'm probably in my best condition because. Be honest with you. When I went to Clemson, I wanted to coach again. And sixties is your best coaching years of your life. If you're if you're healthy, it's the most qualified you'll ever be, and it's the worst time to get a job. You, you're just past that point where jobs are, are being considered. So you, you want to look. You, you want to get healthy and lose weight and look like you're in your forties or fifties. So there was a reason for yeah. I kind of said I'm going to coach anymore. But you know, Paul, this is the first time I've ever gone into a coaching job where I'm not looking to move up. I'm not coaching to get somewhere else. I went to the HR office yesterday, and she says, well, you want our state retirement or you want the optional retirement? It will <laughs> fall over. It, it will kick over to any other state. I said, no, ma'am, there is no other state. There is no other job. I'm going to try. I'm, I'm going to go to I'm 70, and if we get that far, they don't. They fire them here like they do in Alabama or, or the old days of Alabama back when they did it every other week of the year, Tennessee or whatever. They did. If you don't win, they get rid of you here. But I, I would like to get, get this program, get this program, turn it around, into a successful program, and for the first time in maybe 30 years, just turn it over to one of my assistants in six, five, six, seven years, uh, not to some new coach. And, but I don't have any other job lining up. This is this is where I hang my hat, and I'm excited about doing it. Well, congratulations! It's it's uh, amazing to to catch back up with you. Uh, it's been a few years, but uh, uh, coach, all the best. Uh, we'll be pulling for you, and we hope to talk to you again very soon. Paul, thank you so much. Look forward to talking to you again. Wow. Terry Bowden joining us as the new coach at Louisiana Monroe. We will take a break. More to come.